So first, Noor from GTN, a company from our eighth cohort. Most people know about you, but not about us. <laughs> so we are GTN, and GTN stands for Generative Tensorial Networks, which is a technology that we are developing, combining recent advancement in machine learning and quantum physics to improve drug discovery. What we're basically doing is that we are improving the representation of chemical compounds and building advanced machine learning tools that could work on these quantum-based representations and hopefully that would enable us to kind of shine a spotlight in the dark space of drugs and enable chemists to find interesting new structures unseen before and help them be inspired and discover new medicines. By the way, you have a good elevator pitch. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we are now in the process of growing the team. We are hiring people. We are facing some challenges in terms of hiring, in terms of reaching customers, making uh, market product market fit, and these kind of things. Yeah, that's basically. Which it. one would you like to start with? Uh, okay, the things that would kill the company, basically. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. So a, a list at, the, at this early stage. Exactly. It's a list. Yeah. So I think like in this early stage, it's mostly about hiring the right people and. So yeah, so in terms of like hiring the right people, you already talked a little bit about this, but I think my main worry at the moment is that you look at people, you look at CVs, and it says great things, and it tells you how good they are, theoretically, but you won't really know how well they will work as a team, how, how good they are in collaboration, how they contribute to the, the culture of the company. And my feeling is that building the culture, the right, the right culture in the early days is crucial, not only to, to grow the company, but also to attract the right talent to it. So my question is, how do we kind of figure out in the early days whether these are the right people? You also talked about the grit and resilience. So how do we measure these aspects? Yep. So uh, three things. Uh, first is, I think it's good to be very intentional about culture. I think it's smart that you're saying, look, culture and coherence of the team really matters. So, for example, the Netflix culture do document, which they published kind of accidentally, is actually a very smart thing, I think, for any company to do. Matter of fact, if I were to tell my younger LinkedIn self, one of the things I would tell myself is to create a culture deck and intentionally define a sharp culture from the very beginning and do that explicitly. Second thing is um, references matter more than interviews. You obviously want both. But to give you a sense of when I'm hiring for important positions, one of the things I will try to do is I will try to get connected to three to seven um, uh, back, uh, like, I'm gonna, hey, I'm gonna take this candidate seriously. I will try to get three to seven connections with people who have worked with this person before, before I've even interviewed them. Right? And I will try to get some information uh, either in phone or email, obviously people are very hesitant about you know, negative referential e email, although frequently, for example, like one of the techniques I'll use, I'll drop them in email and say, you know, rate this person from one to 10. And usually when, when you get a seven, that means they're not worth hiring, they're not worth talking to, right? So now if you get a 10, you usually write back and say, do you understand what 10 means? <laughs> like this is the best person ever? And if they say yes, you're like, great, that's very useful information. But if you get a section of like selection of eights and nines, then it's like, oh, I should invest more. I should, I should maybe call, I should do more reference checking. And reference checking is much more important because the kinds of questions like grit, like persistence, like will they deal with the uncertainties in an environment? Will they be good collaborators in stress and under fire? Uh, will they be learners and adapters? And like, CV doesn't tell you any of that stuff, right? So that's the kind of thing from referencing. So that would be the second uh, thing to do. And then I think the third is, um, essentially to try to make, uh, you know, one of the things, like for example, one of the questions that, that I almost always ask, and this is kind of in the interview, is thinking about it, is like, all right, uh, uh, like for example, like I'll, I'll say this to entrepreneurs, I'll say this to people that I'm interviewing, is I'll say, all right, uh, in your last job, what did you uh, most learn and what did you most fuck up? Because if they weren't, if they say, well, I was too perfectionist, you're like, okay, you're either not being honest with me or you're not learning, 
I mean, there is true perfectionism, which is a real big problem, right? Or I work too hard. Well, okay, <laughs> right? Um, it's, 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 it's asking that learning because, by the way, true learners will usually have something really crisp that's interesting, right? And, and if you go, oh, yeah, that, that's a good thing to learn. I see how you learn that. I see that's smart. And you have an answer to, I am learning, then that usually is a good fit for the kind of learning culture that you need in a startup. Thank you very much. So the second thing that worries me is um, skepticism from the market. So many people have seen applications for AI in different areas. I'm talking specifically about drug discovery. So chemists, for instance, have seen many trials and errors in like applying AI for drug discovery, for discovering new medicines. And they build in throughout this career this kind of skepticism, some of them about the use of AI, the potential for AI in this field, and they're kind of like pushing back on it as, at the moment. So this is one aspect of skepticism. The other one is them being a little bit worried about losing their jobs to AI, so they kind of fight back as well. Okay. So how, how do we go about it? I know like in, in your, yeah, how basically do we convince these people that there's still potential to AI to solve their long-lasting problems? So, um, uh, again, actually, I think of three things. So the first is, in this early stage entrepreneurial journey, you don't need to persuade everybody, right? You only need to persuade some people. Uh, and so what you're, what you're doing is you're looking for the people who are open-minded enough, who are interested, who are interested in going on that journey with you as kind of early customers and early partners. And so if someone's really skeptical up front, move on. Next person you're talking to, right? Because con uh, convincing someone who is starting from a point of deep skepticism is really hard. And the only way you ultimately really do that is say, oh, by the way, I'm working with three of your competitors and we're doing really, really great things. Sure you don't want to join? And then, by the way, people will get over the skepticism once you get there. Um, the second thing is to leverage, um, you know, kind of outside brand because that's the blink test, right? So that's part of the reason why uh, getting investment from strong VCs or strong investors having people on advisory boards or helping you where they go, oh, well, that person's pretty smart. I wonder what they know that I should learn as part of it. Because then that person who might be like, well, I'm open-minded, but why should I focus on you versus other people? That can help. And that is part of the kind of the, the blink test of doing it. And then the last is um, frequently, this is again like almost the earlier version of the product distribution is, uh, is to tell your story in a way that like, you know, kind of journalist, media, social media will pick it up because that's another way of pointing at things that then, for example, it's like, look, I know that, you know, you'll hear a lot of entrepreneurs saying that this is interesting. Here's something that's really interesting. It's written up in, you know, the Financial Times or something. And that may be something that could cause you, like, for example, if, if someone with some credibility were to provide you a material that essentially looked like, any smart chemist who, who wants to be actually, in fact, creating the drugs of the future will be looking at these techniques very carefully because this is actually how the future is going to look. And it's like, okay, unless I'm an idiot, I'm going to pay attention. Of course, there's some idiots. Then you move on past them and you talk to the other ones. Thank you. So the final thing is that when you usually build a new product, you kind of people don't really know how to fully exploit this potential. I think you already f faced this with LinkedIn. So my question is, how do we teach people, or maybe how to, do we adapt the behavior of our end users so that we kind of maximize the value they gain when using a new product? So uh, I guess one thing is to have the expectations to long battle, right? It's not, it's not done in a week yes. or a month. It's a, it's a long battle. And you, some of these journeys, like it kind of instantly everyone recognizes it. And those people are rare and very lucky. Most of us have to you know, go down the long road, which I think LinkedIn was on. I think uh, uh, you know, usually AI applications of these things is that as well. I would say that um, the, the key thing is to figure out how you can start showing some results. You ultimately want to get to surprise and delight. You ultimately want to get to magic where it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize you could do that. That's awesome. That's ultimately where you want to get to. And the sooner you get to it, the better. But you don't need to get there to start making a difference. If, if, if people begin to go, oh, that was interesting. That's credible. 
So start showing some results, right? So, you know, even, you know, as we got to a uh, couple hundred thousand people on LinkedIn, people started realizing, well, there was stuff I was discovering. Even though we really needed to get to a million for kind of like, oh, this is, a, this is, this is part of an, an active activity. So, you know, the parallels would be like, okay, maybe it wasn't a, a, pharma, a drug to cure cancer. Maybe it wasn't a drug that, uh, you know, kind of is the next most profitable drug in the industry. But, oh, actually, in fact, this search space for this thing that was interesting, we did that. We helped that. And once you begin to have some results, people go, okay, this is serious. And so that's probably it, is both the patience yourself and making sure that you start with, well, what's the first results I can get, even though I ultimately want to get magic? What's the first results I get? I think that would be the kind of thing uh, that I would think about. And then there's probably a set of other things that kind of get to, um, I mean, there's a kind of a, uh, like, um, you know, it's again, like expert endorsement, all that kind of stuff, relatively obvious to you. I'm sure you're already working on that, have that, know about it. Um, it's, it's, it's how do you get people to see it the right way? Uh, frequently you'll hear an answer that's an advertising campaign. I think advertising campaigns are post this moment. Like I don't think advertising will solve it. Um, I do think that sometimes, like for example, if you can, if, if, if you can cost effectively produce what is a in really interesting white paper that's about AI, because a lot of people are curious about it, and then apply it, and then have it distributed, that could be another place that where people start learning it because they start going, like a lot of people are curious about AI. So if you say, here's some information about it, and here's how it links to our solution, then that might also begin to kind of generate, create the education, generate the awareness, have people's mind space start including you. Thank you. I guess one more thing, like unrelated. Yep. So, so last thing. Timekeeper. All right, cool. <laughs> So yeah, that's important then. Yes. <laughs> Should be important. So um, I guess like everybody tells me that team, or like great yeah. investors usually focus on the team, not the yeah. tech. So what, what specifically in the team that gets you most excited? Well, um, by the way, so it's, it's still helpful to have tech and good tech and all the rest, yeah. to be clear. <laughs> right, this is one of those questions where the answer is still both. But team is important. In do you have a big vision? Are you ambitious about it? Are you realistic about the risks between you and it? So, like for example, when people say, "Oh, I have no risks," they're like, "Well, you're either lying to me, or, or you're blind, <laughs> right? Either of which is bad for a partnership." Uh, and so, you know, realistic about the risks, and then you have some ideas about how to uh, tackle those risks, and yet you're learning, and you're learning fast. So, like for example, frequently when I'm having a conversation with an entrepreneur. I'm pushing them on their idea, not because I want them to fold on the idea, but because I want to see how they adapt to challenges and thinking about it and thinking about risks. Because their ability to do that, to take it seriously, to go, OK, I see that. Here's how I think about it. Or even, no, you're wrong. That isn't a risk. This is why. And going through that at a kind of a fast cycle is very helpful. And that's the kind of thing that uh, good investors are looking for. And by the way, if, if that's not the way the investors are inter interacting with you, then maybe you should look for different investors. 